Hello, this is Dr. Jerry Lloyd, and in view of the fact that Jesus was crucified on Passover, as we might see in a few minutes, uh, what day was Passover? What can we know about the feasts of the Lord? Let me read you our introduction, and I'm going to read us our conclusion as well, and read you the conclusion a little bit later, to show you the importance about what we're going over today. It's in the introduction, it says, at Passover, there are four feasts that take place within a week, which of course took place during the last week of Jesus' natural life on the earth, which sometimes we call Holy Week. and and uh, it's interesting that understanding when these feasts took place affects our understanding of when Jesus was crucified. And when everything that took place during the last week of his life, what day and when they took place and the chronology of them. Now, this is important because one third of the New Testament almost takes is a record of what happened during the Holy Week and shortly thereafter, and the 40 days thereafter. That's one third of the Gospels, I should say. And so this is important. Now, let me go ahead and read what we are wanting to get at so that we can see the conclusion before we get to it, just in case the Lord comes before we get to it. There are two main things to understand as we go through this. First, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the day after Passover, was a Sabbath. It was always a Sabbath. Every year it was a Sabbath. We'll read that. Second, the day of Passover, which preceded the first day of Unleavened Bread, which was seven days long, which was the day Jesus was crucified, was not a Sabbath, but it was a special high Passover preparation day. The Passover was a high preparation day for the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread, which was a Sabbath and therefore required a preparation day. The Sabbath Feast of Unleavened Bread was the day following Passover, and that was a Sabbath day. Uh, let's look at some feasts of Jehovah so that we can begin to understand these things as far as the importance of when they took place. In, in Leviticus chapter 23, they are all listed and explained. In verse 3, it says, Six days shall you work, shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest. We're speaking of Saturday here. And holy convocation and here's what a Sabbath was. Ye shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, this was a seventh day. And every week they would celebrate this Sabbath, the day of rest. It was a weekly feast day, if you wanted to call it that. But it had to have a preparation day. And that was on Friday, the day before. Then we read in the next verse, these are the feasts, feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, these are holidays, which ye shall proclaim in your season. Now, in the fourteenth day of the first month, that even, is the Lord's Passover. So, that was what day it always happened. Now, now, why is that important? Well, the Lord's Passover, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it, it says in verse, well, first of all, he says, your glorying is not good, in verse 6. Know ye not that the, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, he's referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, and ye are unleavened. For even, now listen to this, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And now what in the world does that mean? That Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Well at Passover they would do a couple of things. They would have a lamb and they would eat a lamb. Now they don't do that anymore because it had to be sacrificed in the temple and a temple is not in existence at this time. But they, they always ate the lamb and the lamb represented the Messiah dying and paying for sins. And that's what they believed. The, and, and that's what we should believe. The Messiah, Christ, 
would die or has died now and paid for sins. Our, the wages of sin being death. Our sins were laid on him and then he died and paid for our sins. Christ, our Passover, is crucified for us. That's what he says here. Sacrificed, actually, is what it says here. For us. So we see that he was a sacrificial, but, but they also do something else. They have what is called a unity bag there, and it's got three compartments, and they would take the unleavened bread, unleavened, leaven representing, in some cases, or most cases, sin. And so this was unleavened bread, and they would put three pieces of matzah in that pillowcase with three compartments. It was like a pillowcase. And what what did that represent? It was called a unity, a unity bag. And the middle piece, they would take out. The other two, they would leave alone. Now, why the middle piece? Well, because the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father would be the first, God the Son the second. That would be Jesus Christ, and the third would be the Holy Spirit. So that they would take the second piece out, they would break it, and then they would give it to a piece of it to everybody at the table. This is what Jesus, when he broke that bread and passed it, it said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now, he wasn't doing something new, because they had done it for almost 2,000 years. That's what the Jews did. It was instituted uh, back down in Egypt and, and uh, when they were about to be delivered. But what he was doing was he was giving a specific meaning. Instead of this is the Messiah that is crucified for you, it, it, whose body is broken for you or will be broken, this is my body that is broken for you. So he's given a specific meaning. The wine also, which was warm grape juice, red grape juice, that they would heat, and then they would mix it with water, and this would be like the blood and water that came out of Jesus' side. It represented the blood of Messiah. And therefore, when Jesus said, take and drink this, all of you, this is my blood, he was not giving it new meaning. They had been doing that for a thousand years, but he was giving it specific meaning. Instead of this is the blood of the Messiah, he was saying, this is my blood. I am the Messiah. My blood was shed for the sins of the world. And if you'll trust me, you can have everlasting life. So, this is what it means here when it says Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, now listen to the next verse. Now remember, this was the Corinthian church he's writing to. I'm reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the Corinthian church was not only a Gentile church, they were a wicked Gentile church. They were not Jewish in nature for the most part. There probably were some Jews there because it not yet being the end of the apostolic age. When he wrote this, but he says in the next verse, an instruction to the church, therefore let us keep the feast. What peace? The Passover that he's just mentioned. Let us keep the peace, the, the feast, not with leaven, neither with the unleavened mal, with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So that's why it's important. Because this represents Jesus. So, as we look at the Passover, it comes on the 14th day of the first month, which is around April. Then we read in verse, uh, verse four, verse, actually, let's skip down to verse six, I think it is. And on the 15th day, the day after Passover, of the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall, in the first day, which would be the day after Passover, you shall have a holy convocation, uh, a, a feast, a celebration. And listen to what you do. Ye shall do no, no several work there. And didn't say that about Passover. It said that about the day after Passover. So that would naturally make Passover become a preparation day for the feast day. The, uh, Sabbath day, which was next, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. So, and, and then we read over in, in verse 10 of the same chapter, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, when ye had come into the land which I give you, 
and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. And then we read about the feast of Pentecost, but, but, but uh, after that. But at this time, we're reading about the Feast of First Fruits. It's interesting. The Feast of First Fruits was not a Sabbath. They did not have to um, not do any work on this day. Well, what does that represent? The fe fe Feast of First Fruits in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, God says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, if we read about the first fruits here, we find that it happens on the first day of the week after the Sabbath, after the Passover. So that would be Sunday, and that's when Jesus was resurrected. So he becomes our resurrection. He was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. When they would take that, they would take a sheaf of, of the first fruits, and they would wave it before the Lord, and it represented the, the resurrection of Jesus and the Old Testament saints. Remember the, when he was resurrected, or when he was crucified, the saints were resurrected and went into the city. Matthew records that. And so that was the feast of first fruits. Then, if we continue to read on, we find out that there was a the Pentecost, and Pentecost was a Sabbath. They couldn't do any. That was fifty fifty days later. They couldn't do any work there. And then in verse twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, we find the feast of trumpets. That's in the fall. That begins the fall feasts. That also was a Sabbath. And then we read in the next passage, verse 26 through uh, verse 31, 32, we find the Feast of Affliction, or the Feast of, of, uh, day of the Day of Atonement, when they would go in and offer the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. And notice what he says about these feasts. All the feasts that were uh, Sabbaths, he says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls the ninth day of the month at even, and even unto the even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Point being is, these that where they did no servile work therein, these were called Sabbaths. But there were two, and then there's one more, by the way, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles, which is verses 34 or 35. But the point is that these were all considered Sabbaths. They couldn't do work. They all had to have a preparation day, except for two. The Passover was not a Sabbath, nor was the Feast of First Fruits, which was on the following um, Sunday. Now, in view of all this, why is this important? Because we see that Jesus was crucified on the very day of Passover. If we could figure out when Passover took place, we might approach that next time. But the very day of Passover was the day that Jesus was crucified. And then all the other feasts are represented there in the New Testament and mentioned. And therefore, we can get a, t a timeline of the last week of Jesus' life. And we can go backwards from there and find out when he was in Jericho, when he saw Zacchaeus, when he healed blind Bartimaeus uh, and the other two blind men, when he traveled to Bethany, when Mary anointed his feet, and when the triumphal entry. All of this hinges on understanding when the Passover was. Now you understand some things about the Passover that we will approach in the days to come. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Jerry Lloyd. And if you like these messages, then well like them and then subscribe and, and share them with others so that they can also benefit by this speculation. Thank you very much. <music>